Hi, I'm Colin Williams. I'm here at the Global Derivatives 2016 conference and I have Professor John Hull with me from University of Toronto, Rotman School of Management. Um, John gave two incredibly, you gave two very interesting talks today. The first was on can derivatives cure cancer mm -hmm. and the second was on delta hedging. So can you tell us a little bit about those? Okay, let's start with the one on uh, can derivatives cure cancer. It's a fairly sexy title, I guess, but um, the bottom line is that there are projects out there which are fairly difficult to fund because they've got a low probability of success but a big payoff. Mm -hmm. If I asked you to fund just one of those projects, right. say there's a 5% chance it'll be successful, but if it is successful, you know, it's like a lottery ticket, it pays off. I'd probably have a lot of difficulty persuading you as a fund manager to fund it. But if we put all those those a large number of those projects into a portfolio, then we're diversifying the risk and then we can use some techniques which are well established in derivatives markets known as securitization to provide different types of investors with different uh, risk profiles. So that, you know, it was really taking some, taking a technique that's well established in uh, derivatives markets securitization and applying it in a new area. And I have to say it's not, um, I'm not originating this research. I w it was actually Andy Lowe at MIT who looked at uh, how cancer research could be funded in this way. But um, I thought it was sufficiently interesting that I got Andy's permission to present what he's done. And I've extended a little bit, things like clean energy projects and that sort of thing. That's interesting. So Have that, you talked to any venture capitalists about that yet? No, I haven't. I. I I did, you know, I, after I had my contact with Andy Lowe, I, I, I did go to a conference at MIT, which um, was really just about, about this. It was a two-day conference, and what was really impressive was that uh, there were lots of fund managers there. I mean, it was a very well attended by fund managers who were prepared to devote two, year, two, two, two days of their time yeah. to, this, to this concept. So, you know, as, as I said during my presentation this morning, I think it's a natural for, um, for pension plans and uh, some, some types of insurance companies. Excellent, to, okay. To how about the Delta hedging talk? So basically, you know, Delta hedging, of course, is a pretty well-established idea in derivatives markets. The idea is you try and say, well, what's the sensitivity of a derivative price to the underlying asset price? Mm -hmm. And take a position in the underlying asset price to hedge your derivative risk. Um, what happens is that when the underlying asset price moves, uh, its volatility tends to change as well. Uh, in fact, when the asset price moves up, the volatility moves down and vice versa. So a variation on delta hedging is, or shall we say an improvement on delta hedging, is to take account of what we expect to happen to volatility when the underlying asset price changes. So you're hedging against movements in the underlying asset price and expected changes mm -hmm. in in volatility conditional on the change in the underlying asset price so that so that was what i was talking about i mean this is not a new idea in the literature but i we had a new a new uh way of implementing it it's so you're saying that as you walk up the smile curve in price the whole smile curve goes down yeah i mean if the smile curve if the smile just remained the same mm -hmm. then when um the asset price went up as you say, you would kind of walk up the smile curve because the smile curve is is measured in terms of the uh, strike price relative to the asset price. So you would walk up this, <coughs> and actually you'd get the opposite effect. If, if the smile curve just remained the same, you'd get the opposite effect from the one it's talking about. You'd find that when the asset price went up, the volatility also went up if you were just walking up the curve. But actually what happens is it goes down because the whole curve, as you say, shifts down, yeah. Very interesting. So we've heard uh, rumors at the conference here about some new starts at University of Toronto. Mm -hmm. uh, can you tell us anything about those? Yeah, we've got a new program, which um, we're admitting the first students in September. It's the Master of Financial Risk Management program. Uh, we, <coughs> it's, looking very, uh, it's looking very good right now. We have 40 spots on the program for students. Students have to have good quant skills coming into the program, but the program is not just a pure quant program. It's got a blend of, um, you know, quanti traditional quantitative courses, risk management, credit risk, and that sort of thing. And then sort of more general management, you know, operational risk, regulation, other things which uh, students who work in this area need to know. Uh, we had 240 
applicants who met our minimum uh, admissions criteria and so we we're able to be pretty choosy in terms of who we've admitted so we're we're very bullish about the program right now and we've got a lot of interest on the part of potential employers That's good. for these students and I guess one of the things that they might be working on is um, to understand what's the relationship you think between negative interest rates and derivatives R&D well the yeah or well we are in Canada we're not in Europe so we don't have negative interest rates in Canada yet or in the US but uh, Yes, we do have negative interest rates in the euro and Swiss franc. And in fact, I'm giving a workshop on Friday. Mm -hmm. And I was quite surprised to find the number of people who wanted to attend this workshop. And I assume the workshop's about interest rates and valuing interest rate derivatives. And I, I assume that it, the reason why so many people want to attend the workshop is because they want to find out more about <laughs> the, the negative interest rate problem and how you handle it. And I have, you know, it, there's, there's lots of different... Um, you know, the problem is that most of the models that we use in derivatives assume that interest rates are going to be positive. You know, there's they in, in, in interest rates are basically flawed at zero. Um, you know, the classic the classic Black's model and the log normal models, the classic Sabre model, and so on. And uh, we've got to modify those models to allow interest rates to go negative. And then the question is, well, how negative? You know, could they go down to minus one percent, minus two percent, minus three percent? Alexander Antonov had a paper in Risk Magazine last year, which actually is a free, what's known as a free boundary uh, model, where you don't actually have a lower bound. It just mm -hmm. sort of possibility of negative interest rates kind of trails off as you go to lower and lower interest rates. And then there's other people who use uh, models involving the normal distribution. So um, yeah, it's. It, it's you know kind of a, a, an interesting sort of new problem for us in, deriv in the derivatives business. It's definitely been a, a theme at this conference. It has, yeah, and it's certainly you know one of my big project this uh, this summer is going to be bringing out the tenth edition of my book Options, Futures, and Other Derivatives, and certainly there'll be material on uh, negative interest that, that rates and how you handle it. was the first book I read on derivatives. Was it? Way. Yeah, well, it's been around for a long time. If you told me which edition you used, then it would kind of, I could almost tell you how old you are. It's sort of, um, you can sort of, but um, yeah, no, it's done very well. And uh, it's not, it, obviously a lot of things have been changing in derivatives markets recently, the regulatory environment, this whole switch from LIBOR discounting to OIS discounting, negative interest rates, the, these new models uh, for interest rates that we've been talking about. Mm. So there's a, a lot of changes in the book. I, that'll, I say that'll keep me busy this summer. So, so have you been enjoying the conference? So I far? have, yeah. No, it's been a very good conference so far. I've, uh, um, you know, I have, because I'm doing this workshop on Friday, I've tended to attend most of the um, sessions that are on what you've been talking about, the negative interest rate right. issue, because I know I'm going to, I, 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 a lot of the people coming to my workshop on Friday are, are going to have attended those sessions right. as well, and I want to know what they're talking about. But yeah, no, there's, you know, I, I'm looking forward to Life Anderson's session at five o'clock this afternoon on FVA because I know that, you know, FVA has been a, a fairly controversial issue in derivative markets. I've written a lot about it. Um, I don't altogether agree with most practitioners, but Life Anderson seems to be a practitioner that who's more right. or less in the same, uh, you know, neck of the woods as I am. So I, you know, be very interested to see what his presentation looks like. So that's one of the ones I'm aiming to go to. Um, and uh, you know, I've got one or two PhD students who are presenting here, so I've been listening to their presentations as well. Very good. Well, thank you, John. Thank you very much for your time, and uh, hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. Okay. okay. Thank okay. you. Bye bye.